Conference finals last year, Minnesota. But their focus has got to be the here and now after going up 13. And uh, off the play, off the play, there is an injury and it does not look no. good. Injuries are ruining the NBA and the EuroLeague. Ow. Okay, that was very exaggerated. But honestly, teams are losing players left and right. And we're just a couple of months in. We're talking KD, Ja, Luka, Holmgren, Zion, or perhaps the whole Pelicans team. The list goes on and on. Over here in Europe, it's Larkin, Wilbekin, Ballonboy, La Provitola, and many more key players. And it feels like injuries are happening more than than ever, so what's going on? Let's dig into the reasons and explore potential solutions. First up, the modern basketball player. These guys aren't just athletes, they are superhuman at this point. Bigger, faster and stronger than any generation before them. Take Yanis Antetokounmpo, 6'11 and 242 pounds of muscle who moves like a guard. Or Zion Williamson who's 6'6, 285 pounds and built like Hulk but with a 40 inch vertical. Okay, these guys are freaks of nature and they do redefine what a human being can do on a basketball court. But even when we're not looking at extreme examples, most NBA and EuroLeague players are both more athletic and heavier than guys 15 to 20 years ago. Interestingly enough, while the average height of an NBA player has historically stayed relatively stable at just under 6 foot 7, the average weight has gone up by 15 pounds from the 90s to the the 2010s. Even guys like Jokic or Luka, whose game is purely about their IQ and talent, are sneakily more athletic than that type of player from the past. And here's the problem. All that athleticism generates insane amounts of force on their joints, ligaments and tendons. Every jump, every sprint, every collision puts massive stress on their bodies. Getting hit by someone like Zion barreling into the lane is like taking a hit from an NFL linebacker. Now imagine doing that multiple times a week, sometimes in back-to-back -back games, for months and without adequate recovery. Eventually, something is going to give. And it's not just the strength or the size of the players, it's the way the game is played now. Pace and space systems, fast breaks and constant movement have replaced the slower, methodical style of past eras. Gone are the days of grinding it out in the post for like 70% of the possessions. Today, offenses are built around constant cutting, starting, stopping and driving. Players are sprinting off screens, planting their feet hard to change direction and exploding to the rim. These repeated high intensity actions are brutal on the body, especially for players doing them dozens of times per game. Look at Derrick Rose in his prime. His explosive drives and dunks were jaw dropping, but the wear and tear eventually led to those devastating knee injuries. We saw something quite similar in Europe with Fenerbahce's Scotty Wilbekin tearing his ACL in the very first game of this EuroLeague season. Those hop jumpers of two feet are dangerous. And here's the thing, modern basketball demands this level of movement from almost every possession, increasing the chances of injury across the board. Another big factor, the rules of the game. Ever since the NBA started enforcing verticality more strictly, thanks Roy Hibbert, drivers to the rim have been way more aggressive. Guys are throwing themselves at the rim, knowing that defenders have to go straight up. And that's a problem for rim protectors. Verticality makes them vulnerable to awkward landings and high impact collisions. Look at the recent Chad Holmgren's injury. He suffered a pelvis fracture in a game against the Warriors, an injury that will sideline him for at least two months. It happened when Holmgren tried to contest a shot at the rim and ended up landing awkwardly after the contact. Extra pass down to the corner to Wiggins. Wiggins contested and somehow hung in the air long enough as he bangs off the body of Holmgren who is down. His frame of 7 foot 1 and just 208 pounds makes him particularly vulnerable to these kinds of injuries, but the situation highlights a broader issue. And it's not just the big men. Perimeter players are constantly running through screens, switching onto bigger opponents and absorbing contact. When you look over to Europe, the physicality is even more amplified. One of the things newcomers from the NBA always highlight when talking about the differences is more physicality. The court is smaller, no no three defensive second rule so the center just camps in the paint and refs usually allow more contact. It's not the Khabib style of basketball they play in Dagestan but there's definitely more physicality.
Before I get into, in my eyes, the biggest issue, just a friendly reminder to check out our second channel called Outside the NBA. We try to provide some level-headed takes on the NBA there, and I think there's plenty of content for you to watch already. I'll leave the link in the description and in the end screen of this video. So, then there's the issue of schedules. The NBA's 82-game season has been around since 1967, and while the league has evolved drastically, the schedule hasn't. Players are faster, games are played at a higher pace, there are more teams, so the travel demands have increased significantly too. Add in preseason games, the potential NBA Cup final, play-in, playoffs, and international tournaments from time to time. Players are expected to sustain elite performance over a ridiculous number of games. Hence, everyone is now talking about how the NBA has gotten soft and the players are resting more than they did, let's say, back in the 90s. But again, we come back to how much more demanding today's pace of the game is. The NBA's 65 game rule only adds pressure too. To qualify for awards like the MVP or all NBA teams, players now need to hit that threshold. It sounds good on paper as we were tired of all this load management BS, but in reality it can have the opposite effect. Meaning the players get to play even less because they get injured. This rule forces players to push through minor injuries or return earlier than they should if they want to be eligible for those awards. And of course, those awards aren't just for bragging rights, they add quite a bit of bonus money. That's how something as manageable as a sore hamstring turns into a season-ending tear. Europe isn't any better, in fact it's actually worse. Fixture congestion is a massive issue. What a clever term I used, fixture congestion, wow. What I mean by that is players are juggling domestic leagues, cup competitions, Euroleague, Euro Cup or BCL games and even FIBA qualifiers within the same season. Multiple governing bodies prioritize their schedules without coordination, leaving players caught in a chaotic system with no rest. For example, now that FIBA is doing the national team windows for qualifiers in autumn and spring, we have way more double weeks in the Euroleague. At the end of the day, this results in 70 to 90 plus games per season for top players in Europe. And it's not just the amount of games, it's the importance of those games too. Unlike the NBA, load management isn't an option for most European teams. Every game matters, especially since tanking doesn't exist as there's no draft. Finally, let's not forget the international tournaments. In 2022, there was the Eurobasket. Last summer in 2023, we had the FIBA World Cup. This summer, it was the Paris Olympics. And next summer, Eurobasket again. That's four consecutive years with no true offseason for some of the guys. Players finish their domestic season, head straight into the national team training camps and then return to their clubs for preseason. How can you honestly expect their bodies to recover? Without a proper offseason, injuries build up over time, becoming chronic. It's not just physical fatigue, it's mental fatigue too. The pressure to perform at a high level for both club and country takes its toll. And with national pride at stake, players often feel like they can't say no even if their bodies are screaming for a break. To add to the mental aspect but from the NBA perspective, players aren't just athletes, they are brands. Social media amplifies everything and fans expect stars to be available for every game. Miss a couple and you're suddenly labeled as soft or unreliable. Of course, Joel Embiid missing most of his games against Jokic last year wasn't a coincidence. There are exceptions. So we have all these issues, what can be done? I think we start and finish with the schedule. The NBA could reduce the regular season to 72 games, giving players more time to recover between games. Of course, convincing the league to sacrifice the revenue those games bring is another story. NBA teams would lose about 13.5 million in total revenue for every 5 home games cut. Assuming a 10 game reduction from 82 to 72, each team would lose approximately those 13.5 million in ticket sales and in arena concessions alone over the course of a season. For 30 leagues teams, this totals 405 million annually. Now you see what I mean, it will probably never happen. In Europe, it might be even tougher to fix the calendar. For one, you probably won't make teams quit their domestic
domestic leagues and focus solely on the Euroleague, as that would be a huge hit financially. Unless, of course, the Euroleague finds the money to pay them and compensate. But then there are traditions, which I'm sure that both teams and their fans are really tied to. Personally, I'm not a fan, or I could go as far as to say I'm a hater of FIBA having international windows during the season. Firstly, players representing the countries are second or even third tier, as the top NBA and Euroleague guys aren't allowed to go. Secondly, although not all Euroleague teams allow their players to go, the Euroleague is now forced to increase the frequency of double weeks to accommodate FIBA. An alternative used to be the qualifiers happening in the summer, which left even less time to recover. Fixing this problem requires cooperation across organizations. Euroleague, FIBA and domestic leagues need to come together and create a schedule that prioritizes player health. The NBA on the other hand sort of operates on their own anyways, so for them is more of a task to figure out how to not lose so much money. But it's a tough balancing act that requires to consider health, entertainment and fairness. And the fact that the game is changing, well that's just something you can't stop. You can only adapt to it by creating the right environment for the players. But perhaps you see it differently and have other solutions. Or maybe I'm making it into a bigger problem than it actually is. Yes. Let me know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to check out our second channel, like this video, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.